Oh, smoke drum in the house. All right. Hi, I'm Richard Brown, and I'm a philosopher, exactly like the guys I want to talk to you about today. Just some guys with PhDs in philosophy. <laughs> and there's been some action in the philosophical blog scene. Uh, you know, I started kind of my online foray, I guess, with a, with a blog. My blog, Philosophy Sucks. <laughs> uh still current over there i don't blog as much and in fact i was going to write a blog post about this but then i was like no nah, i'm doing the youtube thing so i'm here to talk about a couple of other blog posts <laughs> um which have been going around so there was one uh by eric switch cable um and one from keith frankish and one from matthias michelle uh, so i know all of these guys philosophy homies um, dudes with PhDs <laughs> talking about consciousness. <laughs> let's get it. So you know what? I can actually, let's see here. Can I, um, all right. So who are we going to talk about first? I guess in the order in which I read them, I'm going to react to this, I think. Uh, so this is from Eric Switchable's blog, The Splintered Mind. I highly recommend that you check this blog out. Um, he, he's, he's prolific in his blog writing. In fact, I think he even has a book uh, which resulted from all the blog posts. Uh, he then like rewrote them or edited them or some shit. Uh, what was that? That's the jerk book. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's called Jerks and Other Philosophical, A Theory of Jerks and Other Philosophical some or another, I forget the name of it, but uh, anyway, Eric does good work. And um, <clears throat> my old podcast, actually, uh, Space Time Mind, we had him on um, and he's come out to LaGuardia and given a talk. Uh, and anyway, so I, I think he's the one of the best kind of philosophers in my sense of the word, um, because he likes to explore very strange ideas but in a serious way. So he's, he's not against really sailing off the deep end <laughs> and, and asking very strange questions, but then trying to answer them in a serious way. And for me personally, at least, I appreciate that. Um, I like boring questions and I like interesting questions, but uh, in, in either case, I want them to be addressed seriously. And Eric does that. Um, so anyway, what's the point of his blog post? Well, he wants to introduce what he calls um, a shmambi. Did my ears just pop or am I sounding different all of a sudden? <laughs> what? So shmambis uh, are not shambies. <laughs> uh, people, philosophers, what are you gonna do? Um, so a, a um, Sh shmambi with an M, shmambi. <laughs> Uh, okay, so you have to get the feel of what it is that he's talking about here. And what he wants to do is, I guess this all kind of takes off from a passage in a paper that Chalmers wrote. Um, so in fact, here's what he says. He says, you probably know the work of David Chalmers and Robert Kirk um, on zombies, right? So he, he starts off talking about zombies and we've been talking about zombies a lot. So we're not going to talk about this here, but then he says here, Chalmers briefly notes that entities physically identical to us and lacking consciousness might have some other non-physical property called consciousness. And then he has a link here. Um, so if you click on the link, then you get taken to this paper, Phenomenal Concepts in the Explanatory Gap by David Chalmers, a very well-known uh, paper from the 90s, I think, um, or the early 2000s. So this is a very famous paper. Um, but if we just look for a schmonsciousness, so I have SCH right there, um, we get taken here. Um, so he, this is in the objections. Um, do we have to deal with the argument here? No, no one really cares. So the basic idea is that if you want to use phenomenal concepts to try to explain um, uh, uh, the the uh, the intuition that there's a distinction, uh, that the, the explanatory gap can't be solved, and yet you still want to be a physicalist, you want to explain that away uh, by using phenomenal concepts, that there's a way of 
being acquainted or knowing about our own experience that is kind of direct and just like a kind of um, pointer. Or I don't know, there's different ways of de developing it, but there's kind of a special kind of concept that we use to pick it out. I think everyone's got to have something like this. But anyway, so Chalmers's basic idea is that, look, either that thing it has a dilemma. So either these comments, these concepts uh, are robust enough to actually capture our relation to consciousness, in which case they can't be physicalist because of the zombies shit, um, or they, they, they don't do that, in which case they don't capture our um, epistemic situation with respect to our own consciousness. Um, okay, so here's an objection assert that zombies share our epistemic situation. The fucking allergies are going bonkers, by the way, over here, guys. <clears throat> Revenge of, I thought I got away in October. November has been pretty bad. October wasn't great either. Fuck allergies. Anyway, okay. So he says, where we have beliefs about consciousness, zombies have corresponding beliefs with the same truth values and the same epistemic status. And where Mary acquires new phenomenal knowledge, Mary from the room, obviously, um, on seeing red for the first time, zombie Mary acquires new knowledge of a precisely analogous sort. Um, if this is right, then the crucial features of phenomenal concepts might simultaneously be physically explicable and able to explain our epistemic situation. Um, of course, a zombie's crucial beliefs will not be phenomenal beliefs and zombie Mary's crucial knowledge will not be phenomenal knowledge. Zombies have no phenomenal states so they cannot have true beliefs that attribute phenomenal states to themselves and they cannot have first person phenomenal knowledge. Instead, the proponent of this strategy must conceive of zombies as attributing some other sort of state to itself. Uh, we might think of these states as shmenomenal states. There's the SCHM and the corresponding beliefs as shmenomenal beliefs. Shmenomenal states stand to phenomenal states roughly as twater, the superficially identical liquid on twin earth stands to water. Shmenomenal states are not phenomenal states, but they play a role in zombies' lives that is analogous to the role that phenomenal states play in ours. In particular, on this proposal, a zombie's shmenomenal beliefs have the same truth value and epistemic status as non-zombies phenomenal beliefs. Okay, so that's the thing that, uh, that Eric wants to, to talk about. Um, phenomenal, uh, it, it's still not 100% clear what it is. So I guess I left this page too quickly. So this is the thing that, um, that Eric wants to, uh, to think about. Now, the first thing I thought when I read this is sort of the next thing that Chalmer says. He says, one might worry that a type B materialist view, that, um, one might worry that a type B materialist view, a phenomenal state must be the same as phenomenal states. Right, exactly, because the type B says they're necessarily identical. So if something plays that same role, it's gotta be the same thing. Um, <clears throat> since both are identical to the same underlying physical states, right. In reply, one can note that the discussion of zombies falls within the scope of a conceivability operator, right? Okay, so exactly. So the type B guy is gonna say, um, it's conceivable, but not really possible, right? So that's, um, all right. To avoid this complication, we might also conduct this discussion in terms of a functionally identical silicon zombie um, rather than a physical one, right? Okay, so uh, now here's where I guess the key comes into. This proposal might be developed in two different ways, either by deflating the phenomenal knowledge of conscious beings or by inflating the corresponding knowledge of, I'm getting uh, emails, motherfuckers over here. Uh, okay, so I'm busy guys. <laughs> Being a philosophy YouTuber, don't email me. <laughs> uh, shit, Ooh, it's too real. Realists must. Realists. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So we're developing in two different ways. So a proponent may argue that either Mary gains less knowledge or that Mary gains more new knowledge. Earlier, I argued that Mary gains new substantive non-indexical knowledge. Well, zombie Mary does not, right? So that's Chalmers's traditional 
argument, Mary learns what it's like to see red. Zombie Mary does not, even though they say the same thing at the same way. So the deflationary strategy um, is the one that basically says the zombies and us are the same. Uh, I don't, we don't wanna take that. Um, so let's skip down and look at this. The inflationary strategy involves a proposal that just as Mary gains substantive non-indexical knowledge involving phenomenal concepts, zombie Mary gains analogous substantive non-indexical knowledge involving phenomenal concepts. So where Mar Mary gains substantive knowledge of the form, tomatoes cost such and such phenomenal states, I am in such and such phenomenal state, and this state is such and such phenomenal state. Zombie Mary gains substantive knowledge of the form, tomatoes cost such and such phenomenal state, and I am in such and such phenomenal state, and this state is such and such phenomenal state. So Zombie Mary's new beliefs have the same truth value, they're, they're true, and the same epistemic status, um, and the same epistemic connections as Mary's corresponding beliefs, okay? Um, so now, just before we say anything more, let's just read the rest of this really quickly. So Chalmers says, here, the natural response is that this scenario is simply not what we are conceiving of when we conceive of a zombie. Okay, that's not really what the point of this is, but um, he still says, perhaps it is possible to conceive of a being with another sort of state, call it schmanciousness, to which it stands in the same sort of epistemic relation that we stand into consciousness. Schmanciousness would not be consciousness, but it would be epistemically just as good. It is by no means obvious that such a consciousness is conceivable, but it is also not obviously inconceivable. However, when we, okay, so whatever, um, we don't really care about how this is related to the zombie um, uh, argument. So, that, so that's the basic idea. And then how does, um, <clears throat> uh, whoa, what's happening here? Where? Uh, so how does this relate to what Eric is doing over here? So he says, Chalmers briefly notes that entities physically identical to us and lacking consciousness might have some other non-physical property, we'll call it consciousness instead of consciousness. So we saw how that came up in the discussion and he quickly drops that. Um, so the basic idea that Switch Gable has here is that once you allow that there is one type of non-physical property, why stop with only one, right? So that's the basic idea. Um, there could be many, many different types of non-physical properties that are um, each of them as unique and as grand as consciousness. And so he considers these different kinds of beings. One is um, the ordinary human, we're physical creatures with consciousness. Um, then there's the shmambi, which is a, uh, um, wait, no, no, no. Yeah, there's the shuman. <laughs> it's hard to keep, wait, let's go back over here. <laughs> and look at the ways, ah, here we go. Right, that's okay, so there's zombies, there's ordinary humans who have physical properties, consciousness, but no consciousness. There's humans who have physical properties and consciousness, but no consciousness, right? So these are physical creatures um, that lack consciousness, but they do have consciousness. So this is the kind of thing that Chalmers was considering that the, the zombie world might be. And then there are the new guys, the wonder kindred who have physical properties, consciousness, and consciousness. Um, now, so from their point of view, we're lacking something very important. Um, we're lacking consciousness, which is wonderful. And then of course, uh, once you see that there could be like a lot of these, Switch Cable says, well, there could be this chain going, you know, um, all the way up and we could be missing out on so many of these kinds of properties. So on Twitter, I asked him if these were, if there was anything that it was like for uh, the creatures to have these, have schmanches states as opposed to conscious states. He said, no, they don't have any phenomenal feel, they have schmanomenal feel, um, which is every bit as good as phenomenal feel. And that's where I, I don't really, I start to lose my grasp. Now, granted, we can't form a positive conception 
of this. But what does it mean to say that their epistemic situation or that the that is just as good as phenomenal consciousness, but isn't consciousness, um, uh, so, so, and that there's nothing that it's like for them. Um, so I just don't, it's not clear to me that, that we can really get a grip on what it is we're being asked to conceive. Um, and it's also not clear to me what the lesson is that we're supposed to learn or take away from this thought experiment. So, you know, it, it, because for one, one way to try to make sense of what's going on here is the way like I think about like reading or music or something like that. So my, my dog is watching me read a book and sometimes I'm thinking to myself, what the dog must think I'm nuts. You're staring at the book all this time or um, listening to these weird sounds the dog doesn't enjoy. And that's because there's a kind of experience that I'm having that the dog can't have. So from the dog's point of view, that kind of experience is inconceivable. And I can see, or think I can see, how if I lacked it, then just with the dog, I'd be missing out on something. And so you can kind of extrapolate from there. Could there be kinds of experiences that I can't even conceive of, um, which are so wonderful that uh, I'm missing out on them? And I think, yeah, in this way, maybe. Like, you know, if we somehow merge technological singularity-wise with uh, AI or something like that, maybe there would be things that we would be able to do or enjoy that we can't even possibly imagine now, but which we would enjoy as much as reading or um, uh, <clears throat> people do read, by the way. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, um, but that's not the kind of thing Switch Gable's talking about. He's saying there's nothing that it's like to be these creatures. So they're zombies, but they have something that's just as good as consciousness. And here I can't help but think of the kind of uh, things that Jeff Lee talks about, the alien subjectivity stuff. Um, and, uh, but what is it that we are really being asked to conceive here? It's not clear to me that we can really make sense of something that is as good as phenomenal consciousness, but doesn't involve there being something that it's like, because, the as good part is the part that I think is doing all the work here. So what does it mean for it to be as good as phenomenal consciousness? Well, phenomenal consciousness is, you know, what makes life worth living. It's it gives you, know, so they're, they don't have pleasure or pain. They don't have taste experiences. They have phenomenal, schmaced. What is that? If, if it doesn't involve that there's something that it's like, then is it as good as phenomenal consciousness? I don't know. So this is one thing that I, it's hard. So I, I sort of agree with the Chalmers take on this, that it's not clear we really can't conceive of these things. Um, uh, Shmambies are not, it's not clear what we can, that we can conceive of them or that um, it has anything to do with like dualism. Cause I was also thinking in response to this, gee, isn't, uh, Physicalists, physicalists of a certain kind are going to have the same sort of conundrum because take someone like Ned Block, who's a physicalist, but who also says that there's can be inaccessible consciousness. Now, his traditional argument, he's very clear that what he's arguing for is like, it can't be accessed at this moment, but it could be accessed at the next moment. But he also has said in conversation that uh, he's, open to the idea that there could be completely unaccessible consciousness, consciousness that could never be in principle accessed. Um, okay, so imagine that's the case. Let's conceive of that. Well, then don't you get a version of Switch Gibble's problem? So maybe there's a physical property uh, which these um, physical wonder kindred have, which uh, we lack and um, is so wonderful and so forth, or maybe we have it and just don't have access to it. And so I, I think you get all the same sorts of problems, don't you? I don't know. So what do you guys think? So that was what I was going to write up basically was, isn't this a same a problem for everybody? And um, uh, I guess that's one of the benefits of writing guys. You can organize your thoughts more clearly. So anyway, okay, let's move on to the next one here. Um, Cause really I want to get us discussing this and you guys, in the comments, hopefully have something to say. So that was the one from, do I have the other one? Ah, the other one was from Keith Frankish over here. So this is his blog, Tricks of the Mind. 
which I also recommend that you go and, and check out. And um, uh, he introduces these guys called Jekylls, right? So he's uh, a well-known defender of illusionism. <clears throat> and um, so let's find out what he means by Jekyll. So once again, he starts off talking about zombies. Zombies are the, the starting point for all of this stuff. So, all right, what is a Jekyll? Um, so, so far, let's see, where does he go? Uh, so let's see, uh, well, let's just read the damn thing. Oh, it's right at the beginning. <laughs> <Makes sense. laughs> yeah, okay, so he says, I wanna introduce a related species of philosophical monster, which I shall call Jekylls. Like zombies, Jekylls are atom for atom duplicates of us inhabiting a world with the same physical laws as ours, a world which let's assume is causally closed. Your Jekyll twin has all the same physical and functional states you do, including mental ones. It has the same functionally defined perceptions, sensations, thoughts, desires, memories, and emotions. And it is conscious in a functional way too. It also has a sense of self, built of memories, emotions, and introspective and interoceptive states, all functionally defined. For simplicity, I'll use psychological as David Chalmers does. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the conscious mind, is that what that TCM is? To mean psychological in a functional sense. So far then Jekylls are just like zombies. Um, yeah, so that's question begging already right off the bat. So they're, they're not just like zombies because you've ruled out a kind of um, realism about phenomenal consciousness and functionalists. So, so the type B kind of case is already ruled out. You're already saying, the way this is already set up is already uh, having the implication that um, no amount of physical or functional stuff is phenomenal consciousness. That's the assumption. All right, so he says, there is a difference, however, Jekylls also have phenomenal states understood as qualitative mental states that can't be characterized in functional terms. The phenomenal lights are in on inside as they're supposedly on in us. Okay, but Jekylls aren't just like us either for their phenomenal states are not aligned with their psychological ones. There's a deep incongruity between what they are thinking and feeling psychologically and what they are thinking and feeling phenomenally. Okay, when they are psychologically calm, they're filled with phenomenal rage. So they're kind of invert. Uh, when they're psychological pain, they feel phenomenal bliss. Okay. Um, so and then he cut the punchline. As a consequence, Jekylls have dual sense selves. Um, as a psychological being, they have no introspective access to their body's phenomenal states and their phenomenal states make no contribution to their psychological sense of who they are. The subject of their phenomenal states, whatever it is, is completely isolated. Okay, that's great. Are Jekylls conceivable? Yeah, they are. I think uh, according to the Chalmers crowd, yep. If zombies, uh, if zombies are conceivable, Jekylls are too. Yep, exactly. Uh, we can conceive of zombies because there is no conceptual connection between functional, right? Okay, so uh, now, if phenomenal realism is true, then we are like Jekylls, except our phenomenal selves are beautifully aligned with our psychological ones. So that's the key sentence. He should have put it in bold, but that's... Um, um, that's the key sentence, and I think that's that's the mistake. Uh, so, phenomenal realism is simply the view that phenomenal consciousness is real, <laughs> and any kind of realism gets abused and and uh, so forth and so on. So, phenomenal realism is not the view that. Um, phenomenal consciousness has to be exactly as we naively take it to be or else it's not real. That seems to me to be too strong. So the, the real key claim that Frankish is making right there uh, um, in that sentence, which I guess, should I put it back up there? So we have it before our minds. If phenomenal realism is true, then we are like Jekylls. But no, if phenomenal consciousness is a brain state, then we are not like Jekylls. If phenomenal consciousness is real and really a brain state, then we are not like Jekylls. Um, Je Jekylls may still be conceivable. And someone like Ned Block could say, sure, Jekylls are conceivable, but I don't I think that has anything to do with what's real. As I asked Ned about this one time and he said, basically their problems aren't our problems. <laughs> 
that that's those those creatures that conceivable world that's not us right if this is a um if if this identity claim is true then what that conceivable world doesn't pick out this world it's you know just a mental construction it doesn't tell us anything about the real world okay so phenomenal realism could be true uh and, and notice how he's defining phenomenal realism here, how he sets, set it up, right? So phenomenal realism um, is the idea that, uh, that, that there's something, where, where did he say that? Um, that there's something, so here's the sentence I've been looking for. He says, so far then Jekylls are just like zombies. So they have all these functional defined states. Um, but there's a difference. Jekylls also have phenomenal states understood as qualitative mental states that can't be characterized in functional terms, right? So he's making it clear that he's begging the question um, against the type of view that wants to say that uh, these things can. So, all right, great. Um, but, but also uh, a type B physicalist can accept this and say, look, these states can't be characterized in functional terms, but they're identical to brain states. And we now know from the Phil paper survey, 13% of um, people working on this issue or uh, philosophers they surveyed or whatever the fuck um, are identity theorists. So you can't just assert this. Now, maybe if you're a dualist, um, then you're going to say, okay, yeah, these things don't make a difference um, to your, to your, uh, to the way you, to the way you work. So phenomenal realism could be true physicalism could be true and these things could make a difference and we wouldn't have inner Jekylls or inner Hydes so the Jekyll um, has an inner Mr. Hyde that has the phenomenal consciousness right so that, that but these things maybe they are conceivable these kinds of inverts uh, other people say no so I know there are people like Hedda Hassel Merck, uh, Merck who thinks um, no the phenomenal powers view has it that these things are necessary so they can't be inverted this way and I don't know how people do tend to think this way. Like, with, is it really conceivable that you experience a pain and feel pleasure? And even though you're going, ah, fuck, like, and then you're like, eh, but inside you're, it feels great and you still want to avoid it and all that, you know, psychological stuff. I have trouble conceiving of that. Um, other people do too. So it's not clear that either of these things are really conceivable, but even if they were, that doesn't mean that phenomenal realism is false. It doesn't mean that you're an illusionist unless you, you, you define um, away certain views in the philosophy of mind. So let's just go back and look at the way he sums this up. So he says, uh, we're like Jekyll's, no, no, no. But then at the end he says, but wait a minute, um, how do you know you're, you aren't a Jekyll, that you don't harbor an inner hide? Um, and that was kind of, I, I think, an interesting connection to the switch cable post because that was kind of the, the reaction I had there. It was like, I didn't put it this way when I read it, but, I, but it was like, yeah, um, there could be these you know, phenomenal properties we can't access if you, if you really deny um, or if you really take a strong version of uh, the overflow thesis. You could have an inner hide. Um, uh, okay. But uh, so maybe you shouldn't be sure that you don't. Um, but I, I think I'm reasonably sure that I don't have an inner high that's experiencing something completely different. So he says, and there are two explanations. The first is that you identify with your phenomenal self rather than your psychological one. They're the same. Um, and know that you are not a high. <clears throat> your mind harmonizes perfectly with a psychological mind. Your brain process implement, okay. The downside of this option is that you are strangely alienated from the self manifest in your actions. Why? Um, so the panpsychist has an answer. I just don't see the argument for this uh, line right here. So maybe you guys can help me out. So the other explanation is that at heart, you identify with your psychological self and don't really think you have a phenomenal self at all. No. <laughs> uh, I, I, <clears throat> You're a complex psychological being if you're tempted to think you have a phenomenal self as well as do the fact of your psychology. No, that's, I'm not an illusionist. So this is a, this kind of argument drives me nuts because you're just ignoring the most plausible option that phenomenal consciousness is real, but some of its properties are illusionary. So the functionalist can say, look, phenomenal consciousness is real, but it's kind of 
it presents as this thing that can't be characterized functionally, but it, it can. Um, it's just that the, our, the way we access it, 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 because of various things, blah, 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 and you can say whatever, plug various things in at that point, phenomenal concepts, et cetera. Um, because of the way we access it, we uh, mischaracterize it as not functionally definable. So that's a perfectly respectable view and nothing in these arguments has, has really addressed that. Um, and that's just weak illusionism. That's not enough to, to say that, you know, there is no hard problem or, and, you know, even this is sort of the thing I've been saying all along. These are epistemic things that consciousness appears a certain way to us. Um, but unless you really take this hard line and say, look, it has to be exactly the way it appears. And maybe that's what he thinks the Chalmers types of the world think, but that's not what I think they think. I think you think. <laughs> all right this is already too long so i thought i was going to do the other one but let's save that for a later day um cool how do you end this shit <laughs>